Welcome everyone to the Indigenous Storytelling webinar. We're so lucky to have James Keski Poe uh, with us. And um, this, is, this series is called Remember Your Roots, this Indigenous Storytelling. For Indigenous people, storytelling is both a gift and very old customs sanctioned by the people to teach, entertain, and remember. And thank you, a special thank you to Don Monkman, who allowed us to use his beautiful painting, which was created during a storytelling event, I understand, with James, um, called The Man's Encounter with the Windigos. And so uh, you can see it on the poster here as an original artwork that was commissioned for this, for storytelling. And Thank you so much to James Cascacapo, who uh, we had maybe uh, two weeks ago, we had a storytelling event and it was so popular that he's back by popular demand. Um, he comes from Norway House Cree Nation and is a PhD candidate at the Peace and Conflict Studies here at the University of Manitoba. Thank you, James, for providing uh, the storytelling and I commit to providing tobacco near the river. So we will be taking the next hour to, to tell stories and have some time for questioning at the, at the end. I want to also give a, um, a land acknowledgement from Treaty 1 territory. This is where we're zooming from. This is the original lands of the Anishinaabe and the new Dakota, Inuit and Dene people and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We get our hydroelectricity from um, Treaty 5 and we want to acknowledge the negative impacts which has have occurred in northern Manitoba, particularly for First Nations and uh, including Norway House Cree Nation. And the water that sustains us here in Winnipeg comes from Treaty 3 territory. And we have Shoal Lake 40 First Nation to thank and acknowledge their struggles for Freedom Road and to have safe drinking water access themselves. As treaty people, we acknowledge the damage of the past and present and commit to working in meaningful partnership with First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. So I will stop share and welcome everyone, a special welcome to the elders from Norway House. I believe a group is joining from Norway House of elders and thank you so much for joining. This is so meaningful uh, and we hope to entertain your questions at the end. So James, if you're ready to begin, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for that. Uh those uh, kind words and those acknowledgements, uh, Shirley. Uh, also uh, acknowledge all the listeners. I think I uh, recognize a couple of people. Oh, Levina, I think uh, is out there. Um, also a special uh, acknowledgement to uh, Dave. And I think uh, we have uh, elders from Norway House that are joining in. I'd like to say Nancy to them. Nancy Dino all. So I just say thank you to the elders that they're able to uh, listen in this uh, broadcast. I will be uh, on for about an hour. I'll be watching the time. But, uh, sometimes I, I kind of go over because um, I, I guess once I, I start speaking sometimes, so I, uh, I carry on. Uh, I'll, I'll be trying to be mindful of the, the time. Hi, Dave. Hi. Uh, I see Dave there. Um, everybody else uh, by joining in. Um, mm -hmm. so usually, when I do these stories, I, I get invited to do, do the storytelling. I usually don't prepare anything other than the fact that uh, I, I bring the story. Um, I, I was actually re recalling, we, uh, we were told to, uh, we, I was invited to tell a story at a conference <clears throat> and I was invited to go speak as a as an elder, and I was a little bit intimidated by that. <clears throat> and I, I thought to myself, how um, what I should say. 
but but the theme was a gift from the creator and and somebody asked me hi isabel you got somebody else hi everybody else um i was asked uh, to go speak as an elder and i was a little bit intimidated and i thought maybe i should prepare something and uh, i was getting ready in the morning and, th and that occurred to me and so um i went to the conference like that like um, i knew the gift at least that, that i what was given was the these stories i thought i'm, I'm gonna share that and <clears throat> And so I went to the conference, and uh, there were, I think, uh, three other elders there. And so I spoke to them, and they told me, but one of them told me, I was getting, I was getting dressed this morning, so, and I didn't know what I was going to say. <laughs> so I, 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 that made me feel a bit more comfortable and more more relaxed that, uh, that we were, I, I, in a sense, I, I guess I did the right thing, so go there and uh, share the gifts and speak on the gifts that we had. And the elders did the same, and he shared his gift. And uh, I was really grateful that, I, that he shared those words with me. And I, I guess also that uh, <clears throat> I was still young, that uh, when I was asked, I was asked by uh, two women and uh, to come and speak. And so, uh, and uh, I, I guess it felt so natural in that way. And I told my friend I had been invited to go speak as an elder. And uh, people made a comment that uh, I was a bit young to be speaking as an elder. But uh, my friend said, well, that's a good thing that, that they asked you because then that, that shows that they still respect the elders in the community and that they, that tradition of recognizing the elders will continue. So. Uh, so those wise words from uh, friends really helped me. And then the, 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 the new um, acquaintance that I met, the elder, and I still see him around. So, so it was great. It was a good experience. <clears throat> but uh, also in terms of uh, where I come from, I come from uh, Norway House, Cree Nation. That's uh, north of uh, Winnipeg in uh, Manitoba. I grew up there and uh, I left, I think, when I was 16 for school, and uh, now I'm, I'm still in school. <laughs> I, I took some time off to work and uh, have a life, and now I'm doing a, a PhD. And it, it was difficult to leave the community. Um, it was very difficult to leave uh, my mom. Actually, when I when I when I left her, she was actually crying, and I told her I had to leave. And uh, because I, I spent time with her. And um, what made it more difficult was that she wanted me to keep her. But then uh, this was an opportunity for me to come and uh, continue my, my studies. So it, it, it was very difficult. And uh, so uh, I left. <clears throat> and uh, she's passed on. But uh, I thank her for everything else. And uh, I think that's part of uh, remembering our roots and remembering uh, our elders from back home that are joined us as well. Thanks for today for arranging that. And also, um, the part of the roots, I think I mentioned this last time when we did the storytelling two weeks ago. Uh, I, I talked about the, uh, the roots and uh, the roots of these stories that were uh, entrusted to me through my dad. They uh, come from the community and they've been handed down through the generations. I learned them through my, through my dad, so um, I didn't I, I didn't re learn them through the book, but through the oral tradition, and the oral the, the sharing of uh, knowledge and stories that way, and of our histories. So that uh, that's where uh, these stories come from, and um, glad to share them with you. Um, I get invited to to different conferences, uh, different venues. I've got, I've gone to schools speak with uh, youth and I think last time when we did this um, excuse me when we did the storytelling there was a suggestion that we might, we might do a, a survey of uh, maybe a response from the listeners 
I um, I decided maybe not to go forward with that because I, I understand things like a story, but there's so much more that come out of uh, the stories. When I share the stories with the youth, sometimes they'll come up after the story and talk about something totally different. It's fun to speak to somebody that listen to them. So that's why I didn't want to go ahead with the, with the survey. Because people have their own feelings and I didn't want to impose in, in that right now and respect people's sort of uh, personal time to themselves and how they felt about the stories that, that they might have heard. And so that's why I didn't uh, go ahead with the, um, with, with, with the survey. So I just try to respect people's uh, sort of uh, personal thoughts in that way. Because uh, when we uh, heard the story, when my dad told us the story, he didn't explain what the story meant. And we were left that to ourselves. And, and, and I think in, in, that, in that way, the story grows with us. We are uh, able to somehow connect with us. At least I was able to connect the story and understand some of the, uh, the messages we call those um, the, the knowledge as well, Nipohavina, that wisdom that, that's in the stories that we could find as well as those teachings. Um, the story I'm going to share is called the the man's encounter with the Wendigo. Uh, if you saw the uh, the, uh, the, the the painting, that was done by uh, a new friend as well. They did a collaboration with uh, Don Monkman, and that was uh, arranged by um, my other friend, Judy Doolittle. Judy asked me if I wanted to do a collaboration with, a, with, the, with an artist. I would tell a story and then the uh, artist would do a, a representation of uh, the story. And I agreed <coughs> and the, uh, the post show was the result of that. And so, um, and so take a look at that and uh, thanks to Don and uh, also, thank you to Judy for that. Um, and uh, so, so the, the stories of the uh, encounter with, with the Wendigo. I share this story many times with, with, with the, the children, like you know, maybe uh, four years old, five years old. And uh, I enjoy sharing the story. I think it, it, it's, it's all for all ages. I think, um, and uh, sometimes when I share the story, I, I try to engage the, the children in, in the story. I get them to uh, imitate or maybe uh, connect with the story by, by getting them to uh, sort of uh, make the sounds that might, might generate, come out of the, uh, the story. Like um, the Wendigo, there's a, there's a part in there where the Wendigos are sleeping, so I get them to make the sound of a, a Wendigo snoring. So just, just engage them, so that's a good way. And I, I enjoy sharing that. So we'll uh, get into the story. And uh, also, I think uh, we're talking about the roots. And uh, I learned the story through uh, sitting on the floor while my dad told the story. And uh, maybe I had that gift to the, uh, of remembering and also res respecting the story and the knowledge. And so I didn't write it down. I just uh, through memory, I guess that's all part of the uh, the uh, oral tradition. <clears throat> so I'm thankful for that. And so I'll uh, get into it and then um, maybe afterwards you can uh, share a comment if you want and uh, some thoughts. But I usually do that sometimes when I do the stories. Excuse me. And, uh, well, I'll uh, start now. Usually the stories, uh, they go take us back. Like uh, usually the stories is chaotic, right? Um, some some writers might call that the uh, my, mythical time. Like some, some people that study like uh, stories, the mythic time. Right? Yeah, then uh, some people see that from the very beginning, right? And so um, in those times, animals would talk to humans, and the other way around. So that's a that's the setting of uh, the story in, of this time. And, um, so not a long time ago, the, um, there was a, I'll say human, right? Humans back then, it was a family. And uh, 
husband and a wife. And the um, wife, uh, they were going through a, a very hard time in, in that period. And there was actually a, a famine in the land. There was no food, there was no animals. People back then uh, lived on, uh, by hunting, hunting uh, animals. And by that, that time though, uh, there was no uh, animals. And the, um, the, the way people would, would locate animals and maybe get a, a survey of uh, the presence of animals is uh, by uh, looking for tracks in the snow. By um, seeing tracks, obviously, then we, we know the presence of animals. And sometimes the number of animals that are present just by, just by the tracks. But at, at that time, there was really no absence, there was the absence of tracks, meaning that the, there was no game to, uh, to hunt and then to, to live on. And the supply of um, food for the family was, uh, was going down very, very low. And then um, the husband and the wife understood that. And uh, one day the husband said to the wife, I'm, uh, I'm gonna leave. I'll go further and maybe I'll, fi I'll find some food. But I think uh, he said, I'll just take a little bit of food. But I think there was an understanding then that uh, this was actually a goodbye and that the husband might not return. And, and uh, of course they didn't say it, but they, uh, in, in a sense, I think uh, that was understood that the, the husband might, might not return. But the, uh, they thought, there would be one less person to feed and um, the, the remaining food could go to the children. So the, the, the father left and uh, he began to, uh, to, uh, to walk <clears throat> across the lake and into the forest where he, where he did uh, his hunting. And he went um, further than usual and became uh, to a point there, the land became foreign to him. But um, it was an area that he didn't know of. And he traveled on, but he, he, this is in uh, winter. And uh, he's traveling uh, through the snow with the snowshoes. And uh, by the time he, um, he got beyond the area that he's familiar with, he, um, there were still no tracks. And uh, on his journey, he began to lose weight. Very much so that uh, his, his body became uh, almost just a, a bare frame. But uh, just a, you, know, you, could, you could see the, uh, the bone from his face and his arms become shrunken. And there was no food. And then one day on his journey, he decided that uh, he couldn't go any further. And he, um, he accepted his fate that uh, this would be the end. And he, um, when he decided that, he um, sat down or knelt, knelt down on, onto his knees and rested his uh, knees on uh, snowshoes and ac accepted the what was to come. But while he was uh, down on his knees, he heard a noise approaching, coming towards him. He heard the uh, trees breaking, branches. Obviously he, he thought to himself, something large must be coming towards him. Some, something huge and powerful, because he could, he could hear branches snapping. And it got closer to him. But he, uh, uh, as uh, frightened as he was, he accepted what was uh, to come. And in front of him, one of the trees kind of fell to the side and out stepped the windigo. Well, in our language, we say that week to go, week to go. And uh, stepped out 
in front of him out of the out of the out of the trees and and there was a second one right behind him a smaller one a, sm a smaller windigo <clears throat> but uh, in uh, you know in, in our in the Cree culture the windigo is said to be a human set of uh, become cannibal and very powerful as well so they, they consume human flesh so while he was there, rather than run or flee, he accepted that uh, his fate. And uh, the smaller one, as soon as that small one stepped out and, and noticed him, noticed a human down on the snow on his knees, he immediately pointed at, at the human, the small one, immediately pointed at the human and said, a human, let's eat him. But the uh, older one uh, was looking at the human too, uh, looking at uh, the human. And he, the, the older one reached out and uh, took the, the human by, 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 their, by the chin and raised his face to him and said, well, look at him. He says, uh, there's nothing here. He's a uh, very thin, it's just skin and bone. There's nothing good to eat here. And he said, uh, I have a, I have an idea though. He said, we'll, uh, we'll take him home. We'll feed him. He'll get bigger and he'll put on weight and then we'll eat him, he said. <laughs> so, so, um, but of course, the, uh, the the small one was in agreement. So they, let's do that. We'll take him home. And so that's what they did. The human uh, didn't uh, struggle or make any plans to flee because um, he understood that uh, his predicament and his situation, that uh, he didn't have the uh, energy to run or the strength. And so he, um, but he understood though that the, he understood the, the plan that the uh, Wendigos would, would feed him and uh, that he would uh, allow him to regain his weight, his weight and uh, his strength. And so he went with them and uh, they took him to, to, to their home. It was a, like a, a cabin and uh, well built and warm. And they took him there, and the human settled with, settled in with the uh, with the surrounding. And he, um, as a matter of fact, they didn't bind him or uh, tie him in any rope, because they understood that if he, if the human fled, they would be able to outrun him, and that um, they, they would actually be able to capture the human again. And uh, and, and the uh, human understood that too. So uh, he lived with among the uh, the two windigos. He he left. And he uh, he stayed with them. He prepared meals for them. They would come and go in the morning, and then return in the evening. So he would um, make a breakfast for himself and also the windigos. And then after they left in the morning, he would clean up, make the beds, cut wood and uh, you know, make it something useful in the home. And, and this went on for a while. They come home, but the windows would come home in the evening. There'd be a, a meal ready for them and uh, fire in the house would be warm. And, and then at the end of uh, the evening, they would uh, sleep. They had their own beds. The human had his own bed. And um, so this went on. And eventually the human realized that he was actually recovering. He was starting to put on weight. He could feel his arms and uh, his muscle returning. And he could feel his face filling up. And he knew that uh, it would be time very soon for, for um, I guess at the, uh, at the time when uh, the Windigos would actually uh, prepare him 
And so he um, he thought very carefully about, uh, about his escape. And he always recalled his family that he left behind. And that, that's when he wouldn't forget the, his family. But then also understand his predicament as well. But then one day, he decided well, it was time he couldn't wait any longer. And so he, um, after not to, not to raise any suspicion, he just went as usual. But that day he decided it, it, it would be the time for him to flee and to, to make his escape. And so the Wendigo was left in the morning as usual. And he prepared the breakfast. But that morning, after the, after the Wendigo was left, he um, prepared a, a cache of food for him, like a small bundle of food. And he went into the forest and he went further in and he hung the, the cache of food from a tree. And then he came back, but he didn't come straight home. He made uh, a maze of trails going in and out around trees all over. And so he created a maze, a huge maze of trail of tracks or snowshoe trail. And he went back to the home very quickly as to not arouse any suspicion. He went back to the home and he had the fire going, prepared the meal, as everything else is usual. And that evening, when they settled in into their bed, that, excuse me, the man laid awake. He didn't sleep uh, this night. And he uh, listened to the, the windigos. Eventually, they, he could hear them snoring. And that, that, that they were um, fast asleep. And when when uh, time came, he uh, slowly climbed out of the bed and went out the door. And he had a hatchet with him. He got a hatchet. And he found the uh, windigos snowshoes. And he chopped them up or hacked them up into smaller pieces as to um, prevent them from uh, pursuing him so, so quickly in the morning. And he fled and he went towards some maze of trails that he made the, during the day. And he ran for the cache of food where, that he left earlier as well. And he ran. And he, he ran all night, not knowing that the the windigos would be pursuing him first thing in the morning. And so he uh, ran all night. And in the, in the first first light, he, um, he, uh, the small windigo woke up, always the first, and immediately checked the human's bed, or the man's bed. And there was nobody there, or the, the, the human was gone. And the um, being suspicious, the young one got up and went outside and noticed the uh, snowshoes had been hacked up or had been been, um, been been chopped into pieces. And he knew immediately that the human had uh, fled. Quickly running inside, he went up to the uh, the older window, the, the bigger one, and uh, woke him up. He said, "The human is gone." He said, you ran away, he fled. And uh, I told you, we should have ate him back then. Now he's gone. But uh, the older one slowly uh, woke up and then he uh, slowly sat up. And he said, uh, we'll go find a human. But first we'll eat. So they ate. And the um, and the uh, of course the, the young one was very very anxious, and then said, "And our snowshoes, they've been they've been uh, they've been chopped up into small pieces." But the older one said that we'll make uh, we'll make new ones, and um, I'm not sure if uh, people uh, ever saw uh, like snowshoes being made, like handmade snowshoes. Um, I, I saw it once, very difficult to make and. Uh, 
had to form pieces of wood and then uh, form them like a, give, the, give, the, give them the arch and then the, the webbing. But the, uh, these windigos in the story, the windigos are so powerful, it doesn't take them long to, to form the, the, the snowshoes and also the, uh, the web, the webbing and to drill holes and to prepare the, uh, the snowshoes. And it didn't take them long because of their power. And as soon as they, they, uh, they completed the uh, snowshoes, they went into the forest in pursuit of the, the human. By this time it's morning and then the human's still running. He ran all night. And then uh, once the um, windigos entered the forest, they encountered all the all the maze of trails. So they weren't really sure which 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 trail to follow or which way the, the human went. So they had to spend some time going going like the zigzagging and uh, all the maze of the trails to find that single trail that led away. But uh, they're so powerful and so swift. It didn't take that long to do that. But uh, just enough time to, to, to allow the human to, to go further. And uh, so the, the, eventually they found the, the trail and uh, they were pursuing the human. But the human, as, as he was running to at the same time, realized that the, he might not be able to sustain like the, uh, the, the strength or the, uh, the speed that he was running. And he uh, feel, uh, felt, felt his energy uh, going down as well, failing him. And he, uh, but he, in, in our, uh, in the Cree culture, we have uh, what they call the medicine, right? It's a connection to the spirit world. And this human had a pouch of his medicine that connected him to the north wind. And he took out this pou pouch in one of his hands and lifted it up into the air as he was running. And he called out to the north wind, said, Numusum, reach him in the language means, my grandfather, help me. And then the, uh, the north wind heard the, uh, the, the man's call. And uh, the north wind on that day descended upon the land. And uh, as the uh, north wind came upon the land, he saw the, the windows pursuing the human. And he saw the human running too, as well. And, and then the windigo, or the um, north wind came down upon the land. And on that day, it was a, a fierce winter storm came upon the land. And the, the north wind descended upon the, the tracks and, and buried them to conceal the humans direction that it was going and the um and blew upon the windigos it was such an awful and terrible storm the um windigos were blinded by the snow and they had to stop their pursuit it was uh, that bad but the human understood that the windigo or the um the north wind was there to help him and he kept on running and very soon it was dark again. And he came upon a lake, a huge lake. And he stood there wondering at the shore of this lake, the frozen lake, excuse me, as to what to do. He was exhausted, tired, and he'd been running all night and all day. And he stood on that shore of that lake and he thought to himself, I could go north and get shelter from the north from the north wind, and I could and I could go further, or I could go south, and I'll find a snow snow drift, and I could burrow into it and rest. And then he stood there, and he decided that he's going to go south and uh, find a snow drift, and burrow into the snow and rest, and that's what he did. And then the morning came. In the morning, the sun was bright. 
The sky was blue, like as if there was, hadn't been a storm at all, except for the, uh, the whiteness of the snow. Everything else is buried. And the um, windigos emerged from, from the snow as well. They've been buried. But the, um, do you see the windigo had the extraordinary sense that they could find every little sign of uh, something that went through and they um, slowly moved forward and to the point that they actually stood at the same spot where the human stood the night before at the, at the lake. And they too stood there contemplating which way to go. They thought a human would have uh, went north to get the seek shelter from the wind and go further. But then they also look to the south that um, think that the, the human's tired and that it burrowed into the snow drifts. But the young one was very anxious. He said, uh, the human is trying to get away from us. He's trying to get as far away from us as, as possible. He went north and he was very insistent. And the uh, older one un un understood that, that uh, and he didn't want to uh, frustrate the young one. And he said, okay, we'll go north. And so they went north. It was a huge lake and it took them some time look for sign, tracks, anything. And uh, as they, further on they went, the, the day got later. And eventually the young one uh, conceded, said, uh, yeah, I agree, maybe the, maybe the human did go south. So the said, we'll go south. And then the older one said, okay, we'll go. But uh, before that, the old one went up to a, a small tree and grabbed the base of that tree and snapped it off from, from the base, broke it. And uh, with one fist, he was able to uh, wrap around that, that little tree, strip all the bark and the branches off. It's how powerful he is with just one swipe of the fist, a closed fish, fist, and he snapped the end, the top end and he had a, a pole that was stripped of bark and straight and he gave it to that small one. And then the, uh, and he did, uh, went up to another tree and did the same. And so he had uh, a pole for himself. And he said to that young one, we'll go south now. I usually ask uh, the, 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 the children when I share the story with them what they might do with that pole. And so they usually like, no that they're going to take that pole, go south, go to the uh, snow drifts and poke around with it, right? So they, they know what's under the snow. And that's what they did. They go to a different snow pile. But there were so many snow piles. But uh, by the time the, uh, they were still searching when the evening came. And eventually the older one decided that the, they've lost a human and that the humans escaped and they were standing on a, a snow drift and he said that's it we're, we'll go home and he drove his pole right into the snow just missing that human that was uh, below under the snow and he just said in, in the story he says that the uh, the pole just went right by the, the face of the, the human and the human froze and didn't move and he could hear the uh, the movement of the uh, wind was above but he uh, eventually the wind goes he could hear the wind goes walking away from under the snow you know, the, the crunch of the snow was off and he uh, and he laid there most motionless right into the night and eventually he broke out from under the snow. And he stood there that night and he remembered his uh, family 
his children and his wife. And he missed them very much. And that love that he had for them still remained in his heart. And he thought to himself of uh, going home. But um, I guess in, in, the, in the old way, people would look at the stars to see the direction and to orient themselves as to where they were. And so by using the stars, the human knew which way to go, at least the, the direction to go home. And he walked for, for many days. Because he had to come a, a, a long, a vast distance. But eventually, he came upon a lake, uh, a large lake. And uh, he looked up and down this lake. And he looked ahead. Then he noticed that there were trees standing out in the, out in the, out in the lake. And he ventured out and uh, towards, the, towards the trees that were standing. And when he got to them, he looked up and down. Then uh, his, his things started to look familiar. Then he realized those trees were markers that he put out and that he was actually at home. And th this was the lake that he uh, walked on when he first left his home. And he began to uh, to walk towards his uh, his home, the direction of uh, towards his home. But at the same time, his wife happened to be looking out the window, and she saw a figure off in the distance, but she didn't know who this person was. And uh, and she kept on looking. Eventually, the, the figure got got bigger and uh, and then eventually she was able to to see that it was actually her husband and with all with, ex, with excitement she quickly put on her boots and her large coat a heavy coat and she ran down to the lake and the, and the man could see his wife as well and they both began to run toward each other and on that day out in, out in that lake the human like the, the man and the wife were reunited and they held each other in each other's arms they, they lo loved each other so much and they walked home in that lake and the, the man or the, the the woman said my brother came and he had a net and we were able to, to live off fish. And that's how we survived. And uh, the man told his wife about his adventure with the, um, with the Wendigo, taking him away. And that's uh, the story of uh, the encounter with the Wendigos. So that, uh, that was the story that uh, shared to me by my dad. Um, I think I usually sometimes I, uh, I could remember these stories just by hearing them once. And so, so I, I don't think I remember the stories in terms of the word, but actually the images that I could, I could uh, visualize, the, um, the, the story inspired, and I think that's how I recall the stories. And so the, um, there, was some, there are many themes in that story that uh, we could draw wisdom from that. It was Nepal Hawina, we call them that, that wisdom, and that knowledge. One of them is uh, perseverance, right? To never give up, no matter what the circumstance. Like the, the human was held captive, but always, always hopeful that one day he would see his family again. And also, he uh, always recalled to the lessons and the knowledge that he gained from uh, from from the people people before him, and also. He always demonstrated bravery, right? being brave even at the most difficult times. Maybe when, uh, when courage was all all that uh, he had, and also the uh, the love, right? Always, uh, always recalling the love of the people that the, that mattered the most to him: his family, his wife, 
and allowing that that love to to sustain him right and and to guide him so those are uh, there are too many uh, layers of uh, knowledge and lessons in that story so that um what what i meant by uh there's so much more to the to the story and then the um and those are the teachings that we that's how we receive the teachings also from the elders through these stories and you know, about life you know and, and to, to learn from them so and i i think with that i'll, I'll conclude I, I could i could continue but uh thank you so much for your time that was thank you james that was a, a beautiful story and there's comments in the chat box saying love the story from panos polyzois um Makiko Singh, this is a fantastic story. Thank you for sharing it. Uh, and other people are in agreement. Uh, one person is asking, um, I guess for your initial comments is, um, what are your thoughts about recording stories that are being passed down? And, I, and he mentions a graph or uh, maybe a survey. Um, uh, referring to that, uh, your comments about that? Yeah, I, I think uh, there's actually like um, writings, like, like the academic sources that, that say about the stories, about recording stories and how the stories become uh, frozen in time. In, in, in that sense, right, once they're recorded, and so they're, they're not allowed to, 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 to grow. Uh, but sometimes, so I think, um, I was at the. Um, I was invited to do another circle, a, a story such as this setting, but of course we were doing it in the, uh, here in the uh, internet. But uh, I noticed that uh, there was um, a person that was recording the story I, I, I was sharing, and I inquired, Sim, what uh, what that and then like how we used to learn. I guess my concern about um, stories being recorded is that they're. Uh, they might lose their context, right? And the people that share them have uh, attached meanings to them and where they originate from. And uh, my concern there is that the, uh, the story might lose its its uh, its context, right? And um, like, you know, the community, in uh, the story is generated or created by, by, uh, by the people that share the story and they have those special cultural attachments to them, right? So that, that that's that's what I would say about about that. In uh, in, in terms of like you know, when we hear people, f not just First Nations, but wherever they, they people might share their stories, right? To, just to be respectful of them and uh, how they uh, understand the story, and it's, I think it's very important that we we keep that in mind. And uh, thank you for that uh, comment and that question. Thank you so much. And many other comments saying thank you for sharing your story. Chief Deborah Smith says, love the story, James. Always enjoy uh, your storytelling. Sherry Selvin, uh, there is a question. It says, uh, after saying it's an engaging and deep story, I would like to know to what degree you have reworked or reshaped the story that your dad told you. Well, th thank you for that uh, question again. That's a very important uh, question. What, what I... Uh, I've heard people say that the, they might actually try to like update the story, but but I think uh, the story is about the human spirit, right? About the human experience, and it crosses over generations. And uh, depending on how how old that story is, like it's been handed down through the generation. But I think we can still connect to it, regardless. Sometimes like it, it crosses cultures, right? We understand about love, and through through time, and di different different space, right? And uh, those cultural spaces. So I, I, I try to tell the story as I underst understood it and uh, almost like verbatim, but of course, obviously we're translating it into English now, but I try to capture the essence of that story in that, in that way and uh, respecting the, also the, um, I guess the, the knowledge of the elders. So I, um, I try to uh, like recite the story the best I can from uh, the words of uh, my dad. So, so I, I hope that answers your question. And uh, you know, a little bit clear with that. Thank you so much. 
Uh, another question uh, was about the Wendigo is, so are these creatures animals or some kind of spirits? I think uh, some, some people say that it might actually be maybe both, right? but, uh, but certainly they're human. And uh, they, they, they say that uh, they've been, uh, they've been uh, overcome by, 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 the, by the spirit as well, right? So they, um, they're human, but they've also been transformed into a, almost like a spiritual character. Like uh, in a story, we say they have uh, this extraordinary senses, right? Like uh, when you're tracking the, the human through the storm. So that's sort of a, kind of a, almost a supernatural sense that they possess. So thank you. And I have a question about language and there's more questions coming up is, um, so normally you would say, um, say this in, in, in a new or free and do you find it's more powerful? Is there lots of hidden meanings or me well, not hidden meanings, meanings in the words, right? Um, that when they translate to English uh, that are missed. Um, yeah, thank you. I think that's, a, that's a, one of the, um, the broader questions that, that, that I asked right? in terms of like, you know, we're talking about cultural sort of like dialogue. And obviously that the, some people say that there are three words that are very difficult to, to translate into to English. It seems like they have a, sometimes like a, a fused sort of a meaning, like a, almost like a compound meaning, where uh, like sakitun means to love, right? To sakihau, almost like a, that strong attachment. So, um, so how we express those emotions and how they're um, like formalized in a dialogue, right? And uh, even, uh, I, I guess my, uh, my field is in, uh, Eastern conflict studies, when we talk about forgiveness, right, in, in terms of uh, conflict, like uh, in our in our um, language, it's win means there are no there are no more thoughts between us. That's part of that expression of forgiveness, right? So th those are sort of uh, cross cultural sort of uh, expressions, and uh, sometimes I'm a little bit concerned too that uh, some people have that expression of uh, lo losing meanings in the translations, right? And the context. So um, yeah, there's there's so much more, I think that we can speak on that point for, for like, for, for like you know, we could actually, there's books written on that. So thank you for that, uh, Shirley. And a great question from Ed. Um, did you wanna unmute and, and ask your question or, or I can ask it for you? Um, it's referring to uh, James Bartleman's okay. novel. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Uh, thanks right. for unmuting. Okay, I might as well show my face. Uh, Joel, I mean, James knows me. We were in uh, Sean's class together. Hi. <laughs> yeah, hi. <laughs> nah, nice story telling there. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, I was, uh, I didn't, maybe I didn't put that question quite well, but what I'm driving at is I've read uh, James Batuman's novel, uh, As Long as the Rivers Flow, and a couple of other indigenous uh, literature. What I find is that there's always, you know, the use of stories such as the one that uh, you have told uh, here. And I remember somebody was asking that question about what do you think about documenting this story? In this uh, imaginative works that I, just, one of which I refer to, I see the use of these stories. I mean, what's your view? with you know that kind of use as opposed to just recording the stories for you know people to make anything they will i mean they want with that that's the question i'm trying to ask here i think also that uh, i think i also asked that question as well i um actually uh, I felt, thank you for that and uh, let's see but um i asked that my, my, myself that question too i've actually written out the stories, all the stories that I've, I've, I've known. I did that uh, all in one sitting, maybe uh, three days of uh, like you know, recording them on the, on the computer. And I'm still hanging on to them. And so I, I have uh, maybe a still on that ongoing debate, right? Um, I think uh, some of these stories like, you know, they have also individual, our own individual understanding, right? Like, I think sometimes these stories are kind of what they call the, the Medeo stories, right? 
you know, spiritual stories that people shared. And those, those meanings are contained within the spiritual context, right, of uh, the people that, that shared them. So um, I think some people get, get in this kind of like, almost like a dissidence, right? Where they, uh, they accept the story. Like I, I share teaching sometimes of our like, relationship with the animal. In the, in the Creek culture, some people that still know the le- understand the lessons. The, um, when, the, when the hunter takes an animal uh, to, to kill, that they pursue, say that the animal leaves its body and travels into the forest, like the spirit of the animal, and then uh, and it returns again, to almost like a, a rebirth. I, I shared that uh, sort of uh, that understanding with, with a friend of mine. Immediately, they, uh, they decided that uh, they didn't believe it. But my view was, uh, it was not so much about whether we believe it or not, but whether we uh, are able to communicate our own sort of understanding of the world, our construct, right? So, um, so uh, I, I, I don't want to get into the debates with people, but I, I think I'm more concerned about understanding where they come from and their own understanding of the world, right? And then that way we can communicate in a, in a kind of like a respectful context, right? We're actually engaging in a, in a meaningful dialogue. So, um, but that in, in terms of recording the story, I, I think I'm still debating that too. I, I, like, I like to respect the uh, oral tradition. As a matter of fact, I, uh, I mentioned that the, I, I can visualize the story to the, the, somebody I was, I was sharing with. And they told me, well, maybe like it's a it's a spiritual gift, right? Uh, uh, being able to visualize that story. It says maybe you you weren't able to visualize that story. Maybe we were allowed to share that or to see that story, to visualize that story. It's, it's sort of like you know, more of that connection to that spiritual realm, right? Or the supernatural in that way. So the um, so um, I'm, I'm not sure if I yeah. Uh, I think it's it's a, it's, a, it's a good debate. Like you know, I think it's a personal as well. Right? So so I I can't speak for uh, anybody else, but I, we do have an expression in the Cree. It says, "Kino mai mai right? So it's it's up to you, and then we we respect people's opinion as well. So thank you. And maybe one last question. And Dave. Um, Swanson is with the, the elders from Norway House, and thank you so much for attending. Did you want to unmute and ask a question? And in the meantime, there's a question that maybe is, is related to the last question, is the interpretation. Your dad, um, so you said your dad told the story but didn't offer explanations, uh, just let you interpret it. Do you think that's um, the tradition? Is this the way that that you know, uh, uh, like this meaningful dialogue, but also the questioning, right? It, it stays with your mind, and you question and go over it, and it becomes an in, internal dialogue as well as an external dialogue. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, so the question is uh, again, sorry is so the lack of interpretation just leaving it and not explaining it is that the tra- a, a tradition and something you learned from your father at least uh, for my dad he he didn't explain provide an explanation we, we heard the story and then uh, and then that was it as a matter of fact uh, some people actually tell me that I, I tell strange stories or so you would even say the weird stories right but of all, all the symbolism that's in the story, but I think within that symbolism, there's always that meaning, right? We, we, we get to uncover within our own sort of like, you know, our, our own frame and our own analysis. But um, in terms of my dad, at least uh, he didn't tell us, but what I found, so I've, I've learned all these stories and they're actually a continuation. They're actually, once we begin to learn the stories, we actually realize that, that there's actually a sequence to these stories, right? Um, I, I used to go meet, uh, visit another elder. Uh, I, I hope uh, his family doesn't mind me mentioning his name, but uh, I'd like to acknowledge him as well. His name's uh, Tommy York. 
I used to go visit Tommy and uh, Tommy told different type of stories. To, uh, he shared more of the historical stories, right? historical events. And uh, again, uh, so that was a different type of stories that he shared, right? And uh, I found that he was able to provide more explanation in, in, in that setting. But I always knew that uh, I go visit Tommy and he knew we, we had this kind of like a, this kind of relationship, this exchange that, that was happening. And when, when I come to his house, it was always that, uh, like, you know, that general kind of a greeting, how are you, and nice day. And then we, we, we sit, and then it go quiet. And then he would say, Asai, it's the time, meaning to share the, the knowledge. So there was kind of a, a segue into that. So, um, so it was, it was a, a different type of relationship, and I, and I, and I I've always find that kind of a, a little bit, uh, almost kind of a, kind of a, like a, a different kind of a way of learning. It's so all like where we do this type of learning when I go to the institution or the academy. Right? So, um, so the, those times with the elders were, were special in, in that way too. But then they were actually just sharing up uh, this knowledge. Right? So. Um, so, so I'm kind of carrying on that, so sorry. Oh, no, I just want to acknowledge that Dave um, Swanson um, unmuted, and I think he has a question, or the elders have a question. And okay. it would be great if we could see your video, Dave. Well, actually, I just wanted to make a comment, uh, uh, you know, in, in regards to the stories, uh, we didn't particularly just learn the uh, lesson or lesson specifically from one specific story, but rather as James says, a variety or a combination of stories. Uh, so that way, and, and the thing about it was that it, it always sounded better in our indigenous language. <laughs> I just wanted to make a comment. Thanks, Dave. That's a really great note to end. Thank you so much to James Kaskadpo. Uh, quest Kikapo. <laughs> and uh, I thank you all for attending and we're hoping that James will come back in a couple of weeks and we'll get in we'll have another storytelling time together. And uh, so please stay safe and uh, we'll meet again soon. Take thank care. Bye-bye. Bye. And thanks, James. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you for all the questions. Bye. Hi. Oh, sorry. Hello.